Today, we're going to talk about a guy named Gene Deal, and we're going to break down his body language and all the little cues we see that let us know, hopefully, what he's thinking and whether he's being honest with us or not. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Yeah, so qu just quickly, this guy was Diddy's security in the 1990s. There are lots of photos with him with other folks, with lots of hip-hop stars. But he's made accusations and a statement regarding a bunch of topics in the hip-hop industry. Among them, he says that Biggie's death wasn't at a drive-by, so that's a big deal. In these videos, we've taken excerpts from an interview with a guy named Mighty Bolton on the art of dialogue. These clips that I chose are just about the Diddy lawsuit and past behaviors. And these clips are where he says he has firsthand knowledge, no, nothing gossipy, nothing secondhand. Man, you know, a, a leopard don't change his spots. And Diddy been doing this for a real long time, bro. He been doing this for a long time. And now another artist, this artist didn't wait 10 years. You know what I'm saying? He didn't wait 20 years. You understand? He waited a year or two after he stopped working with him and saw he didn't get what he was supposed to get. And he said, yo, listen here, man. I'm putting in my claims right now because I'm going to show everybody what really happened, what really went down. It's, it's crazy. When I was reading it, I read the, the whole thing. Shout out um, uh, to uh, Keisha in Kansas City. She sent me the whole, the whole documentation, bro. And, you know, the whole court thing. And when I'm reading the stuff, you know, uh, it sounds from a lot of a lot of it sound familiar. You understand? And what I mean sound familiar, how he would get other girls and get girls um to try to, you know, convince this guy, you know, or or, or put him in a sexual situation with other girls so he could do whatever he wanted to do with him. And it's 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 just like the situation somewhat with Sarah and uh, her girlfriend and him and Ja, you know what I'm saying? Bringing girls on to try to convince this other guy to be in a room with another naked man and all his other bullshit. Yo, it, it all sound familiar, man. All right, Chase, what do you got? We're seeing a lot of his desire to communicate that past behavior equals present behavior. And we're going to see that as a theme kind of repeated throughout this. One thing he says is a leopard doesn't change its spots. This one is powerful. When we grow up, we develop millions of neural connections that are like habits, but they're stronger than habits. They are behavioral patterns and they're ways that we seek identity. We make friends and we gain influence. And when somebody's methods of gaining power and influence are tied to increasing levels of power, it ingrains those behaviors so deep, it's almost impossible to change. There's a pathway uh, that lots of people take when they get famous. The unethical behavior gets normalized after seeing people do it that they hang out with. And there's feelings of entitlement that erode ethical boundaries in almost every case you can find where there's stuff like this. And P. Diddy's Puff Daddy's risk-taking behavior is one of the reasons that he's successful. But risk-taking behavior and comfort with risk is always a double-edged sword, especially when this kind of behavior is normalized. And with somebody with eroded ethics, risk-taking behavior, and tremendous wealth, who also has charisma at the P. Diddy level, it's a recipe for bad stuff. If the allegations are correct, uh, we're not looking at something that has been recently developing. We're looking at decades of behavior here. So the behavior here that I see is honest. I didn't see a lot of deception. Here. I didn't see any deception here. But keep in mind, we aren't aware of the question here just based on the clip. Neither are you. And we're, we're not in charge of the questions either. So somebody can exhibit zero signs of what we call potentially deceptive behavior and still be lying. And we'll talk about more of this uh, here in a bit. And, uh, that's it. That's all I got. Scott, what do you got? My wife is a private investigator. And I asked her, where do you start when you start an investigation? And you know what she said? Google. I search them online. Have you ever Googled yourself and you were shocked to see the personal information exposed on one of those public listing sites? Of course, <laughs> I Googled myself. And you wouldn't believe what I found. It knew where I used to live. It knew my old phone number. It knew all kinds of things I had no earthly idea were out there. Data brokers are making a fortune selling your information to robocallers, spammers, and others who want to learn more about you, like where you live. 
That's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura can identify data brokers exposing your information and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Brokers are legally required to remove your information if you ask them to, but they make it really hard to do. So let Aura handle it for you. You can try Aura free for two weeks using our link. Aura also does so much more to protect you and your family from threats you can't even see. And it's really easy to set up, so you don't have to download a bunch of different apps to get parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. You get everything at one affordable price. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online so you can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. You can either let people continue to exploit and profit off your information, or you can go to Aura.com slash TBP. Aura.com slash TBP to start your free two-week trial. There's also a link in the description below. All right. I think this is one of the best examples of congruence and language we've seen. That, that affirming body language that says, I know what I'm talking about. This is what happened. And you can rest assured this is what, that's the feeling you get from watching him. So I think these his, his confirmation, uh, not just his nods, but everything, his illustrators are, are spot on every time when he goes in because he's feeling the emotion of getting this across. Now, he's thought about this. He may not have rehearsed it, but I think he's told it quite a few times because he's told it to other people, apparently, because it's coming out really quickly. And he can hardly wait to get this out. So I think he's he's got some built-up resentment, probably, toward P. Diddy and I, I think his voice inflection is commensurate with every move he makes. Every time he speaks, every word he's trying to hit, he does. And that makes it even more powerful. So I think he, I believe he believes what he's saying. So I don't see any deception in there at all. Zero. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm going to agree with both of you um, 100%. And add just a couple of things. And Chase, that's the best example I've ever heard of the organism does what made the organism successful. It's not always healthy. Sometimes it can be very ugly and very unhealthy. And it brings them to the scene of the crash. But it's how people get there. What I love about this, we're going to get a really good video to talk about eye accessing. And I'm going to show you where it comes out really powerfully in here for two reasons. He's very comfortable in his body. That's how he's always made it, clearly. And... His eyes move fairly freely, and the guy's a great questioner. Those are two very good points when you're asking this. When a person's telling you something that, that you can verify, and they're showing you how their baseline works, you should use that to compare when you ask hard questions. We're going to see a lot of that. I agree with you guys. I don't see any deception here. I see some really good congruency, good emphatic body language when he shifts to another artist said. And then when he starts with that people don't change, He's talking about the highlights of the lawsuit. So this is something anybody can read. He doesn't have to. So he's verifiable. And then watch him. He says the artist didn't wait 10 years. He didn't wait 20 years. Right on point. He's downward tone. He's got an emphatic downward tone. He's emphatic with his illustrators as he tries to explain. His hands even do mechanical things as he's talking about the mechanics of something. That's when he's explaining what's going on in a lawsuit. Love the fact that he then shifts gears to the past. And Chase, to your point, he is doing something we always say, past behaviors indicate future behaviors when they're relevant. And so when you watch him and you see what he's doing here, now he goes to, to talking about what Diddy did in the past. And he's explaining and all these words and everything aligned again. There's congruency in the area that's provable. And so we get now to body language is emphatic, cadence and tone that are emphatic. And that same thing, everything he said is there, except there's one additional tool, one additional thing that we see that we haven't seen yet, and that's disgust. That's powerful because now what we know is he believes, like you said, Scott, he believes exactly what he's saying. He's disgusted with that. Let me t bring up something because I know it's going to come up in the comments. We covered a Cat Williams video where he said Diddy was not safe to be around him, basically, and that kind of thing. And he did this. Remember, I said he looked like T-Rex. His hands went to his body. You have to now wonder when you hear this, because I never said he was lying. Never said I just said there's a baseline deviation, a baseline change. People read into that whatever they will. But does that mean that he really feels threatened? Does that mean something else? So go back and watch that Diddy, I mean, that uh, Cat Williams piece, and see how his body language changes when he talks about Diddy. Powerful guy. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, this is somebody who is confident, confident telling their story that they have firsthand knowledge of, and is convicted. 
uh, in that a huge amount of conviction. This is the kind of person you'd want on the stand. This is the kind of person who would work well in front of a jury because it, it's clear from moment one. What have we got? We've got hands in what I would call the truth plane there, open palm gestures, nice and wide. Now, of course, you can be trained to do that. I train people to do that. Do I think this person's had any training? No, doesn't look to me like somebody who would take any training on this, even, even if they were up against it. I don't think this is somebody who would come to somebody like me and go, can you help me look more honest in this situation? He doesn't really need it. He's naturally there open palm gestures in the truth plane. Lots of baton gestures. These are the gestures that conduct along to the rhythm of the speech. And he's talking quite fast. And the batons, they, they, um, they're they absolutely lined up and he illustrates at the same time. So that's really hard to do if you're unconvicted, if you're not confident or you're not telling uh, the truth. Then we get strong reiteration of the ideas. So Scott, instead of getting something like fading facts, where somebody maybe says right. something once and then drifts off at the end and you never really hear what happened at the end, he will say it strong and then he'll repeat it even stronger. Mm. So that for me is 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 real conviction. Um, clarification as well on sounds familiar. And here's what I mean by sounds familiar. So he doesn't just leave something, he takes an idea and then he re-clarifies that as well. So we as the audience can be even more sure of what he's saying. Um, and re-clarification and, uh, rather than chaff and redirect, rather than going, I'm going to kind of leave that idea there and go off to another one that isn't really pertinent to it. No, he stays with an idea. He re-clarifies. When I first saw the, this, this footage, immediately out the gate, I was going, this is going to be good because... If he has first-hand knowledge and he started this clear and this effective, where's this going to go? So let's find out. Let's find out where this one's going to go. Man, you know, a, a leopard don't change his spots. And Diddy been doing this for a real long time, bro. He been doing this for a long time. And now another artist, this artist didn't wait 10 years. You know what I'm saying? He didn't wait 20 years. You understand? He waited a year or two after he stopped working with him and saw he didn't get what he was supposed to get. And he said, yo, listen here, man. I'm putting in my claims right now because I'm going to show everybody what really happened, what really went down. It's, it's crazy. When I was reading it, I read the, the whole thing. Shout out um, uh, to uh, Keisha in Kansas City. She sent me the whole, the whole documentation, bro. And, you know, the whole court thing. And when I'm reading the stuff, you know, uh, it sound from a lot of a lot of it sound familiar. You understand? And what I mean sound familiar, how he would get other girls and get girls um to try to, you know, convince this guy, you know, or or, or put him in a sexual situation with other girls so he could do whatever he wanted to do with him. And it's 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 just like the situation somewhat with Sarah and uh, her girlfriend and him and Ja, you know what I'm saying? Bringing girls on to try to convince this other guy to be in a room with another naked man and all his other bullshit. Yo, it, it all sound familiar, man. man. And it was crazy. And for the people that don't know what you're talking about, because the lawsuit is new, so, you know, some people still catching up with it. Little Rod, he alleges that, you know, young Miami cousin tried to have sex with him in front of Diddy. Yeah, he went into the bathroom and then she came into the bathroom and tried to, uh, you know, throw herself on him. He didn't want to have nothing to do with her for whatever reason. And then when he came out the bathroom, she continued to try to do that and try to have sex and uh, want him to have sex in front of uh, Diddy and the rest of the people that was in there. You know, that's that's how they do, man. They try to use a girl that you might like or you may think you might like or they think you might like her or whatever to convince you to lay down your guards with them. And he didn't. Yeah, that's crazy, man. And you're not surprised by none of this because you said that Ja Rule, they did this to him, right? No, remember, remember, remember and people got it confused when I said that Ja and him was in the room with two girls, with, with, with Sarah and Sarah's girlfriend. You understand? He was trying to get Ja to go at Jay-Z. 
So what he did was try to get another girl, you understand, to do something with Ja. I guess, I don't know, they in the room together. So when they in, in, in that thing, I know what he was planning to do because I heard the conversation. I knew what was going on. He was trying to get at Ja. So if he got Ja in any kind of uncompromising position, he could force Ja to go at Jay-Z. So that's just a a a a a a a a a a thing that they use. Lil Rod, he get him in a sexual position and a sexual situation with some kind of girl, and then maybe have get him high, get him drunk, or whatever like that. He don't know what he's doing. One of the guys step in, and now he doing Lil Rod. Now Lil Rod all messed up in the mind because he started off with a girl, but now he end up with a guy. He trying to put him in some kind of situation like that. They do that all the time in the industry. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so you want to see a guy who's relaxed and comfortable in his own skin? Here he is. And the reason I say that is you, everybody's going to say, well, he's sweating, so that must mean he's stressed. He might be stressed, but he's quite comfortable. You don't see him wiping it off. He's not worried about it. And I went and watched other videos. You can also say his respiration is up. That's his normal respiration pattern. It's about four or five hits faster than mine or yours, maybe. But it's, that's him. So when he rap when he ranks up, we'd be able to notice it. But that sweating and high respiration, I don't think is really any indicator that he's being deceptive by any stretch. People will point to that he sweated, so he must be lying. Well, that's an absolute, and that means nothing. So that's where I went. The interesting piece is he starts off with his hands folded up, and he goes from there to open and moving. I think he just folds his hands because of where he's sitting in the chair and how comfortable he is. It just looks like that to me. If you also look, he uses his head to emphatically illustrate while his hands are doing mechanical work again. His hands are illustrating what his brain is thinking, the machinations of it. And there's no change in pitch by pitch. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. By tone, te he's telling, he's downward. There's And cadence is boom, 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 boom. There's none of that, not one change when he says, I heard them talking about getting Ja Rule together with Jay-Z. That's pretty powerful because it says... This guy is telling you what he believes is true. Now, we can't be in a room with somebody, but we can say what we're seeing here. We can't read his mind, but we can say he surely looks comfortable telling us. Mark, I don't think he's a guy who's come and talked to somebody like us. If I had a security guy, I might like this guy to be a security guy because he looks pretty unflappable. That hand out to the right, and you see his hand go off to the right. And a lot of people are going to say, you always say illustrating out of frame. But I don't think that's an illustrator out of frame. I think, it, Chase, you're going to talk about hemispherical tendency. And I think his right hand is his negative side, and he is way out there that this is way outside of what's acceptable for him. We look at his fingers are now spread. We associate that with confidence. And again, we see mild disgust in his nose as he closes. That's a pretty big deal. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, look, here's the difference between this and Cat Williams. Um, he's not speculating at all. This is firsthand for him. Whereas with Cat Williams, entertainer brilliant comedian is, is going to be prone to making things bigger, to exaggerating, of course, because it's better storytelling when you do that. The issue comes with that is you don't know when is an exaggeration in order to get an effect and when is, is just the real, um, the real detail. Uh, and also there's a lot of speculation and a lot of positing uh, certain words with other words because that's the nature of innuendo and that's in comedy all the time. Here we don't have a comedian, though he might be fun to be around and a, and a, and a, and a lovely guy, who knows? I don't know. But, but certainly what we've got is no speculation at all. And so we have linear storytelling. We have this event, which and this event, which leads to this. And so this happens, and so this happens. And it doesn't move backwards. He gives reasons and motivations as to why the, uh, these things happen, which which sounds to me like what we'd call compromat, which is, which is the idea of getting compromising material on somebody so you can leverage that at a later date. It's, it, you know, from my point of view, just seems like, you know, there, there may be some some, you know, odd, uh, interesting, salacious sexual activity going on at the same time. But it seems to me what he's suggesting is that, that this is all in order to leverage at a later date, uh, in order to um, uh, have authority over somebody, bully them into, into what you need them to do. Uh, he's also very happy to correct very happy to say no that I didn't say that exactly at that point here's here's what it is happy to correct um and to your point Greg 
the sweat. We do see sweat coming down here. Let's look at him. He's a big guy. He's super animated at that time. His hat's on. There's going to be a lot of heat coming off his head. That sweat coming down doesn't look like, to me, the sweat of somebody being deceptive. That's the sweat of a big guy getting animated under lighting. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, the uh, y'all covered a lot of the behaviors that, uh, that I saw here. and So let's cover some psychology behind this. The behavior here looks precisely like every other honest person I've ever profiled. And keep in mind, we all do this professionally outside of YouTube. Uh, Scott and I have sat together in courtrooms and selected juries, advised on jury selection. And Mark is the guy that trains world leaders, and I'm not talking about B-listers. And Greg has written more books on this than all three of us combined. And every once in a while, I see in the comments... And somebody says, well, you know, this person's been through X and Y and they had stress or they had this going on in their life. And maybe you didn't consider that. I promise you. I promise you we are more in tune with stuff that affects context and situation uh, than you could probably imagine. And as a fun fact, uh, Aunt Williams talked about being people being put into compromising situations like this. Uh, yep. And as a Interesting fact here, the CIA developed a literal playbook for this type of behavior and blackmail operations in the 1950s. And this is all public information, by the way. It was called Operation Midnight Climax. So for about 10 years, they lured people into sexually compromising positions. They filmed it, took notes through a one-way mirror on the wall, and they wrote secret manuals for developing blackmail. And they called this uh, one of these playbooks. They're really creative. They just called it Dirty Tricks, literally. <laughs> and when it was about to be made public, the CIA director, his name was Richard Helms, ordered a full document destruction order. So it was like Enron at the CIA with paper shredders going off like crazy. The documents that survived are all public information now. So if you want to see something interesting, <laughs> type in Operation Midnight Climax into uh, Google later on. Scott, what do you got? Uh, this is a family show. This is anybody, Chase. So, just, <laughs> so anyway, while, while this guy's listening to, while uh, what's his name, Gene Deal? While Gene is listening to the questions, he's locked in on that. He's, listening, he's looking at a, a Zoom screen, you know, computer screen. That's why he's talking so loud. He's like, bro, and saying really, which sounds out of character, you know, for so, for someone's baseline or for his baseline, I would think, because we're not really going to get his natural sitting around the house talking, relaxed baseline. We're just going to get that one where he's hollering at a computer, which is fine. No, no big deal. But until uh, in a little while, we see his voice volume change a little bit, but not not right now. So he's as he's staring at this at this screen, he's making as the guy is asking the questions. He's making sure he gets every bit of information because apparently, no matter what you ask him about this, he's got the answer. And I believe what he's saying is he looks like he's being true. It doesn't look like he's being deceptive at all as he's, as he's delivering these things. He's showing us all the cues of someone who's sincere, someone who's honest, someone wants to tell you what's really going on and is concerned about it. That's what it looks like to me. So I, 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 I'm not seeing any kind of deception here. I, 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 you know, I don't want to talk bad about P Diddy or anything, but man, this ain't looking good for him. So I don't know. That's all I'll say about that. You, you uh, and us, yeah, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. So there you have it. All right, Chase. Chase is the first one in. You're going to get that. You're going to win that one. Thanks, you. Hey, let's Thank talk you. for a minute about this, uh, Special on Prince Andrew. Mm. He watched our, the, the the actor apparently watched our watched our shows yeah. on that. Yeah, Mark had, Mark has linked to the Times and it's actually in the Radio Times. Yeah, yeah it was in the interview. It was in the Times. Uh, I think in Town and Country or something like that as well, which is a very kind of uh, right. um, aristocratic, upper middle class thing. Yeah, let's put, a, let's put a link to that thing below so people can go see it. So no, we're not just making this yeah. up. That the guy yeah. actually, the actor playing Prince Andrew, watched our. You know, he was learning well, about his sure. body language. Yeah. He came and watched our our episodes on him. Well, I started watching it last night. 
and we and I haven't got um, to the to the interview part of it. But when I saw in the trailer the interview part of it, his body language is spot on. Like he's really, really he's really so he really actually, had yeah. studied it. And and he's and you see him do some of the things that we talked about. How do they how do they like, medically yeah. stop his uh, sweat glands from working? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the, yeah. So the, that's smoke, and, smoke and mirrors, smoke and mirrors. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. classic. He just acts like he's not sweating. He acts like he's not. Yeah, it's an act. Yeah. Well, you see. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, take a look. It's a it's a, it's a great show so far. I watched half of it last night. I'll, I'll watch the rest. Let me of watch it tonight. Yeah. Tonight. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Man, and it was crazy. And for the people that don't know what you're talking about, because the lawsuit is new, so you know some people still catching up with it. Little Rod, he alleges that you know young Miami cousin tried to have sex with him in front of Diddy. Yeah, he went into the bathroom, and then she came into the bathroom and tried to, uh, you know, throw herself on him. He didn't want to have nothing to do with her for whatever reason. And then when he came out the bathroom, she continued to try to do that and try to have sex and uh, wanted him to have sex in front of uh, Diddy and the rest of the people that was in there. You know, that's that's how they do, man. They try to use a girl that you might like or you may think you might like or they think you might like her or whatever to convince you to lay down your guards with them. And he didn't. Yeah, that's crazy, man. And you're not surprised by none of this because you said that Ja Rule, they did this to him, right? No, remember, remember, and people got it confused when I said that Ja and him was in the room with two girls, with, with, with Sarah and Sarah's girlfriend. You understand? He was trying to get Ja to go at Jay-Z. So what he did was try to get another girl, you understand, to do something with Ja. I guess I don't know. They in the room together. So when they in in, in that thing, I know what he was planning to doing because I heard the conversation. I knew what was going on. He was trying to get at Ja. So if he got Ja in any kind of uncompromising position, he could force Ja to go at Jay Z. So that's just a a a a a a. a, a, a a thing that they use, the, Lil Rod, he get him in a sexual position and a sexual situation with some kind of girl and then maybe have, get him high, get him drunk or whatever like that. He don't know what he doing. One of the guys step in and now he doing Lil Rod. Now Lil Rod all messed up in the mind because he started off with a girl, but now he end up with a guy. He trying to put him in some kind of situation like that. They do that all the time in the industry. Quote, man. And if I'm not mistaken, Stevie J, he was with you the night Big got killed, right? Yeah, Stevie J was there. Stevie J was there. And as soon as Big died, he was supposed to get on a plane with us, with them, and go to New York. He rushed to Faith Hotel. <laughs> rushed just to the hotel. He was wearing my cross and my chain. Right? I said, Stevie, I'm not selling you my cross. My cross got blessed. He said, let me wear it. I said, yo, okay, bro. Uh, he gave me $1,500 for the chain and then never paid me for the cross. Ended up giving Faith the cross and the chain to give to little Chris Wallace. That's what he said he did with it. You think it's a chance he was cracking Faith back then? I don't know what he was doing, bro. But it's funny they end up now. It's funny he ran to uh, Big's wife when uh, he got murdered. Okay, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, look, here's what's interesting for me. He's now less animated on this. Interesting story, but slightly less animated. I believe that's because he's now getting into more speculation. Uh, speculation about what? Uh, about about why people did certain things. Now, what, what I like about this is, for example, with Cat Williams, when he gets into, well, a lot of what Cat Williams is talking about is is more speculative, okay? Some of some of the, the events he was maybe there for, but it's hard to tell which ones he's there for and which ones he's speculating about. With, with Gene Deal, when it's speculation, he clearly indicates that his body language calms down. He's softer with it. And so that's useful for us because now we know that he's being 
way more honest when he's animated and when he's telling us exactly what he's seen. So what's he speculating about here? Well, it seems to be who this cross and chain went to. I'm not entirely sure why, but it seems like there's some worry about Stevie J and and why he went to visit Faith Evans, it turns out, who is the wife of uh, Biggie Smalls. As you can see, I don't run with this crew, never have, so I'm not quite sure who these characters are. Um, but essentially speculation as to did that cross and chain go to faith, I think. That's all I can surmise about it. But ultimately, the important thing for me is uh, more speculation there and therefore less animation. And that's good as we keep going forward because we can look out for does he become subdued in areas where he's saying he knows what happens. If he does, then I would worry that he's being honest at that point. Uh, Chase, what do you think, though? What do you got on this one? Yeah, good. He he looks up for genuine recall. He narrates with his body the cross and chain. He's great with narrating with his body, his hands on his chest. And when somebody has information like this, and they're willing to back up and correct that uh, some elements of it, uh, where somebody said that's a, a very powerful signal. So when somebody can go backward for just a second and add in information that specifically adds in detail and doesn't do it in a way that increases their innocence or someone else's guilt. That's one thing to always look for when you hear somebody telling a story and backing up. And this happens right when he says, uh, he goes back and says that uh, that's what he said he did with it. And that's a very good sign. This whole thing looks great. Scott. All right. This interviewer absolutely love this guy. Why? Because when he asks a question, he zips it. That's it. And he waits till the question until the answer is finished, and he keeps sitting there waiting for more information. If everybody would listen, if every interviewer would listen to this guy interview people, I'm sure all of his, his interviews must be this way because it's so natural for him. He's so he doesn't he doesn't try to jump in, he doesn't try to add anything right after it. He just waits. And then he keeps talking. Well, I would say don't do this as a tactic on its own. Make sure, like when somebody process or sends you a bunch of data, take a minute to actually process what they said, and that will look that will make you less nervous in the moment instead of waiting for a social pause. Nailed it. Yeah, yeah. So if this were an interrogation, this is where I would be f just fascinated with what happened because I would start gathering information around that line about he was supposed to go get on the plane or supposed to go somewhere else after the after the shooting so this tells and and so that's what it's coming straight to me i'm wondering how the hell did he know what was going on uh, unless he's gotten information af afterwards about that where they said here's what was going to happen but he's talking like he knew what was going to happen so if he did what's he doing out running around free if all if all that is true that's where i that's where i'd climb up his hand in on that I, I i wouldn't i'd do it gently because of how um forward he's being with all of his information and, but that right that right there made all my little flags go up about what what's going on there now again there's no pause before he answers this guy's loaded with with the answer he's ready so he's either rehearsed this a bunch of times which i don't think he has but he's told the story quite often because that's the way it comes out naturally, because they can't wait to tell you when it comes out like that, because he's coming out strong with that. So that 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 lets me know or lets us know that he's aware of what of what was happening. And I think he was there. So wh whatever that would mean. Now, when he asked about the relationship between Stevie J and Biggie's wife, he's watching what he says. And that's the that's where it gets kind of weird there. That weird face he makes, that that elongated thing lets me know that there's he he he's being careful. He doesn't know what he should say about that or how much he should say about that. So he's protecting somebody in there or protecting some information in there because he's running that um through his head again before he answers. He's going back through and restructuring that, I think, because we're seeing disgust and anger. So something's up there. But that long pause there lets us know there's an issue. Greg, what do you got? 
Yeah, I think what you're seeing there, that facial expression is a combination of facial expressions. I see it all the time. Remember, guys, I don't, don't bring this up all the time, but I'm a 25-year corporate guy who worked my way through a corporation and watched people try to BS their way through meetings along the way with all this other stuff going on. And what you see is that twisting of the jaw. Just watch him for a minute and pay attention to that lower jaw working. His head tilts, that's accompanied by an asymmetrical facial expression. I think that asymmetrical expression is contempt in how to deal with what he should do. At the same time, he's working his mouth as he thinks. He eye blocks, and then he comes up, and he's settled on what he's going to say. And I think that's what we're seeing. It makes me actually feel better, Scott, because if a person comes in and bam, 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 with no hesitation, it means they're scripted. You don't have uncertainty when you're scripted. You know how you're going to answer each question. Mm -hmm. And you're out of the gate. You're stepping in. You're waiting. You're setting up your next question. But I, I see a lot of that. And I also see illustrating negative stuff with his right hand again. Then he purses his lips to disapprove when he says, I, I think that's what he said he did with it. He, you're that long vowel change where he says he did with it. And you think, well, he's questioning whether the guy's telling the truth or not. Then there's some distaste. And then the throwaway eye roll. All that means he didn't believe what the guy did at all. And, uh, combine that with the jaw working. I, I just think, and, and then he does disgust again when he talks about this guy running to Biggie's wife. I mean, this to me is about the best possible way I think this guy could deliver this message because it's not scripted. It shows disgust. It shows uncertainty. And while I'm with you, Scott, if he knows all this stuff, well, he probably does because he was security for these guys at that point. Now, that doesn't mean he know who killed him or how he got shot or any of that kind of things. But this is where it starts to get really interesting because this they don't ask in this interview, but this is one of the places he said it wasn't a drive by. It was something else. Mark, you still got to go? No, no, I'm, I'm done. Okay. I'm done. Well, I'm, I'm glad you got that eye roll. Uh, Greg, because I missed that out, and it's one of the best eye rolls that I've yeah. ever oh, seen. Beautiful one. In fact, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful eye roll. Well, let's yep, talk agreed. about this for a second. How there's, I don't know, that bothers me. That part about where he says he was supposed to go do this because he said it just it, it rolled out, man. So I, I don't know. Well, but who know. knows how many times it's been discussed since that happened. Remember, that that was a giant event. I remember when that happened. You know, in music, that was a big deal. I'm sure you were still in the music industry. It had to be a big deal in those days. So think about how much impact it had. And people go back and remember what they were doing and they were supposed to go here. I, I, I think it's probably a combination of discussion because he's not overly prepared for it, in my opinion. There's got to be somebody out there looking up, trying to find out. I'm sure the guys that handled that case were aware of that. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's as far as I go with that. I'm looking at I know, Chase. I know. Quote, man. And if I'm not mistaken, Stevie J, he was with you the night Big got killed, right? Yeah, Stevie J was there. Stevie J was there. And as soon as Big died, he was supposed to get on a plane with us, with them, and go to New York he rushed to Faith Hotel. <laughs> rushed just to the hotel. He was wearing my cross and my chain. Right? I said, Stevie, I'm not selling you my cross. My cross got blessed. He said, let me wear it. I said, yo, okay, bro. Uh, he gave me $1,500 for the chain and then never paid me for the cross. Ended up giving Faith the cross and the chain to give to little Chris Wallace. That's what he said he did with it. You think it's a chance he was cracking faith back then? I don't know what he was doing, bro. But it's funny they end up now. It's funny he ran to uh, Big's wife when uh, he got murdered. Yeah. But looking at this lawsuit, right, you know, Little Raw, he alleges that, you know, Diddy, he'll put his hands on him. But, you know, when he'll put his hands on him, he'll disguise it as horseplay. But he felt like Diddy was trying to groom him, in a sense. Well, with the horseplay situation, I used to see him do that with certain women. You understand? Uh, when he was mad, upset, or or he he was too old for this shit, but he would do that play fighting shit. You understand? So I can imagine him play fighting with Lil Ron. Because, you know, a lot of people could say what they want to say about Diddy. You know, he got a knuckle game. He will fight you. You know what I'm saying? You his size, you understand something like that? Around your size, something like that, he would fight you. 
he had a knuckle gang. He was he wasn't that dude that like people try to say he was some old scared bitch ass nigga. Nah, he would fight you. You understand? So I could see with a person like Lil Rod, he probably was roughing them up, grabbing them, groping them. You know what I'm saying? Acting like he playing with him, but he actually want him to do what he want him to do. So, like I said before, that shit he did in the past. So when I read it from Lil Ra, I see he's doing the same shit he's doing in the future. So you hear him clearly talk openly about the behavior in the past and how it makes sense to him to see it in someone else's statement about something more recent. And he doesn't say that probably happened. He doesn't say that's what happened. He doesn't right. confirm it. So that's very good for him. That's uh, very truthful appearing. And as we age, our, what I would say, once extremely adaptable brain, and this is why kids can learn new languages and stuff so fast, becomes less and less flexible because of a decrease in what's called neuroplasticity. More specifically, if you want to ever look this up, it's something called synaptic plasticity. So meaning that it's harder to change established behaviors. This is especially true for behaviors associated with success or increasing social value. So these behaviors trigger the release of dopamine, which is a little neurotransmitter that reinforces the action, makes it more likely to be repeated. And as the behaviors are repeated over time, these brain pathways that support those behaviors become stronger and more efficient, essentially becoming the brain's default setting because the brain will always default to efficiency. So to make it even deeper, these rewarded behaviors become intertwined with our sense of identity, which makes changing them feel like a genuine threat to our sense of who we are as a person. So this combination of reduced brain plasticity, reinforcing nature of the reward system, and the entanglement with like who I am as a person makes ingrained behaviors very resistant to change as we get older. I didn't even talk about the body language here. Sorry to disappoint. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, that's a great call, though, Chase, because a person becomes on autopilot, in effect. Most of the things they're going to do, those subroutines, those things they put in, you know, it takes a couple of thousand passes down a neural path to create it and get it started. And that just gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And then when you get older, one of the things to pay attention to, watch people when they're in dementia and you see them shedding off some of them. Those profoundly developed ones are still there. And that's yeah. the thing you see them do in repetition. It's pretty interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. um, so the main point for me in this thing is that he has got, he's back on facts and we can tell he knows the patterns the same as in the, it, as what this guy's done before. And if you watch him, you see him doing exactly the same thing. Downward tone, cadence, consistent. He's more relaxed and care where his hands are. He's back to the facts, all those same things. The only place we see any deviation from that is when he tells us that Diddy is a fighter, that he's, he says he's got a knuckle game. He's a puncher. He's a fighter. You see his brow go up like, hey, you, are, are you following me? Do you understand? He's not what you think he is. He's this. That's good because that is another reinforcement of he's trying to convey message and he's trying to get you to get it. Remember, when we talk about the forehead, I often call it the billboard of emotion because I know Desmond Morris said it's the easiest thing to control because it's closest to the brain. I find it exactly the opposite. Otherwise, we wouldn't automatically raise our brow when we see people we know and can and be confused when a person flashes their brow as to how we know them. So I think a lot of our face is not under our control. And that's one that is really easy to see. Um, he, when he, and if you don't believe that's what he's doing, he even stops and says, you know what I'm saying? At the end of that, there's the same disapproval. At, he's doing the same stuff again. There's distaste. And maybe even some disgust in his face when he does it. Scott, what do you got? All right. I think this one is one he's not so sure about as he, as he is the other ones. Because we see that little single shoulder shrug, his volume's down a bit. And then his, mov his movements are much slower, as is his cadence. Now, what we've seen at this point when he's using the illustrators, he's using both hands. He's doing this, that, running around, everything, using both hands. And all the videos up to now. But in this one, he just uses the one hand, his right hand. You guys were talking about how it's the, the negative things he's talking about but he, we're just he's seeing that one is the illustrator the other hand comes up for a second when he gets into it but just briefly it comes up but he's mostly just using the, the one hand so that's a big change for me when i'm seeing that all these things are changing like that so i'm not so sure he's sure about this 
I, I think he's trying to give an answer. I can't tell if he's trying to to watch what he's saying or he's not. He doesn't know. So I don't know. I, I don't think he, he knows much about the specifics of it. But um, it, it's something I'd want to come back to if I was interviewing or talking to him. But Mark said that just a, a few minutes ago, like any time speculation is introduced, it lowers uh, observable confidence. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think Ray said call. that. Yeah, well, when it came to illustrators, I mean, we we talked about that on. Well, here certainly that's what times. we're 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 seeing with them. Here's why I think in this case, I think he's quite an interesting thinker, quite a good thinker, in that he he starts off with a bunch of possibilities, uh, horseplay or or domination or violence or grooming or sport. He sets up a whole bunch of possibilities as to the behaviour that he has systematically seen so is it just playing around is it like real physical domination is he a violent person is it a grooming system that he has um you know is, is it is it a game is it is it a sport and and deal says look regardless of all of this there's a strong pattern of behavior here whether it's male or female so there doesn't seem to be a differentiation that he'll only do these things with males or only do them with females it's either, and it's done around being angry or upset, he says. And then he goes on to say, acting like he's playing with them. So actually, we might be able to discount the sport element of it or the horseplay element of it and just go for its dominating, its violence or and its grooming, because those are the ones that he doesn't then discount. And he just acts like he's playing. So what do I get as a, as a profile at the end of end of this? Uh, from from what Deal says, and Deal is is strong with this. He's very clear. Um, uh, I think I think his body language calms down a little bit because he has to take us through a thought process on this. This is not like here's exactly what I saw. Here's the door that opened. Here's the room. Here's who walked in. It's 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 psychological. Um, it's more psychologically or motivationally speculative, but but ultimately the profile we get here is is somebody when angry or upset will get physically dominant with a male or a female. Doesn't matter when angry or upset, it's going to become physically dominant with male or or female. What would interest me at this point is like, well, what do you mean exactly by upset, or or what uh, what would get this person upset? We don't get a question around that that would interest me but certainly it's it's very clear that there's a pattern of behavior when angry or upset this person gets physically dominant and it doesn't matter whether it's a male or a female makes no difference and this is a pattern that has been seen uh, by deal over some time and he's very credible when he's putting that information across. But looking at this lawsuit, right, you know, Little Rod, he alleges that, you know, Diddy, he'll put his hands on him. But, you know, when he'll put his hands on him, he'll disguise it as horseplay. But he felt like Diddy was trying to groom him, in a sense. Well, with the horseplay situation, I used to see him do that with certain women. You understand? Uh, when he was mad, upset, or... or he... He was too old for this, shit, but he would do that play fighting. Shit. You understand? So I can imagine him play fighting with Lil Ra, because you know a lot of people could say what they want to say about Diddy. You know, he got a knuckle game. He will fight you. You know what I'm saying? You his size. You understand something like that? Around your size, something like that. He would fight you. He had a knuckle game. He was he wasn't that dude that like people try to say he was some old. Scared jazz Nick. Nah, he would fight you. You understand? So I could see with a person like Lil Rod, he probably was roughing him up, grabbing him, groping him, you know what I'm saying? Acting like he playing with him, but he actually want him to do what he want him to do. So, like I said before, that shit he did in the past. So when I read it from Lil Ra, I see he's doing the same shit he's doing in the future. Okay. And he also alleges that, you know, Diddy is the one that told him personally that he slept with Usher and Stevie J. Well, I, I mentioned that earlier that he said uh, about Stevie J. The Usher part, that that's a touchy situation, man. 
You know what I'm saying? Because I had a certain feeling and I, I felt a certain way when Usher got on Shay Shay. And I don't mean to mention other people's platforms, but he got on Shay Shay and he mentioned how great and how good Puff taught him and everything. You know what I'm saying? About the business. Right? I know and people know that was around that in that time that Puff and Usher did have a situation. And that situation led Usher to the hospital. Now I let Usher explain that to y'all. I let Usher tell that story. But how dare you say a man that groomed you, you gonna give him a pass. Bro, you know I know. Let me re let, let me reframe you on something. Remember Usher? We was at the Swiss Hotel. Puff was had Kim in the room. Had one of Keith Sweat's baby mothers in the in in the uh the big room outside the master bedroom. He came outside in his robe. He came outside in his robe. She gave him a right there. His back was turned to me. She gave him a You knocked on the door. I came and opened the door for you. Puff went in the room. You came in the room and kissed that girl dead in the mouth. Now I'm telling that because you take enough for somebody that you know and a lot of more people know didn't do you right when you was at Diddy Camp. Y'all put it together. But Greg, what do you got? Yeah, here's another example of him using facts and anchoring what he knew. This one is real close to home, and you can tell because he's resistant. We're back to that thing I called uncertainty, that jaw movement, the eye blocking, the contempt, the same stuff. It's not that he doesn't know. It's that he doesn't know how far he should go and that it's a touchy situation. You can see it. And then his eyes move down into his left into internal voices. He contemplates what to say next and even touches his face. That's thinking. We all know that when a person's feeling some stress and they reach up and touch their face, we'll get to see another example of him doing it even more pronounced here in a minute. But then that grimace is he decides, okay, I'm swinging for the fence. Then he comes out with the biggest illustrators we've seen. He, As he shifts, he navigates and breaks eye contact for the first time. So we know it's going to be kind of heavy stuff. Then he goes to talking to Usher directly. And then he does this, I know, touches himself in the chest. And he does the, I know, you know all of that kind of thing. I think we start to see some real power in what he's saying. And then the visual up left recall. I mean, this is this is auditory for him because we've been listening to him say what people heard. But when he starts trying to describe the room, he goes up and looks. It's not something he's memorized. He's going up and talking about it and he's pulling the room together. If I were making up something, I would just say baby, baby, the baby's mom is in the other room. I wouldn't have said, hey, it was this room and it was this way. I would probably go the other way. And... Then if you look at him, you can see he's emphatic with his pitch, tone, volume, and cadence. And he's now batoning with his hand. First time we've seen that. It's all congruent for how you were treated. And this is back to his baseline of establishing facts and then telling you his thoughts. Still looks believable. Still looks powerful. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I'm in full agreement with you. This And keep in mind, we do not compare notes. Before any of these, so when we, we film these episodes, to. when we get on here, maybe we start talking about it. We don't yeah. go wait. Hang like, on, stop, man. Stop, stop, stop. Yeah. yeah. So we have no idea what we're going to say before each one, and we we don't know if we're going to disagree or not until you're seeing it live right here. So this is genuine and honest. And here's what I want to teach you right now: when somebody is on a campaign to push a hard narrative, you're going to see very, very different behavior. You're going to see disparaging comments that are maybe covertly said, an unwillingness to say anything positive, or they're less likely to say positive things. They're less comfortable with unknown data. They need, they, they show a need to say that happened, that happened for sure. They're 
uncomfortable saying, I don't know. And they're more willing to elaborate and accuse. They're more willing to pronounce the likelihood of guilt, which we're not really seeing here. And finally, you're going to see a lot more selling of a story than telling. And we're seeing telling here. What we're seeing here is honest recollection. And the important points that he's highlighting show us a lot about his behavior. And if we simply analyze his statement right here, just this, and you can listen to anyone this way, you can hear his personal feelings and see his worldview. He's got a strong sense of loyalty and justice, and his priority is authenticity and maybe even a, a disdain for what he sees as hypocrisy or inauthentic behavior. And we've seen that routinely now in every video that we've looked at and Diddy's life follows the archetype uh, of something completely different. Uh, maybe we can look it up or maybe Mark will talk about it. This is something called a Faustian bargain. Mark, what do you got? Well, yeah. The Faust, yes. Yes. Maybe actually, maybe we won't go down that, uh, that, that particular crossroads. Uh, so, um, Look, the phonetics here or the stress is happening. Puff and Usher did have a situation, and that situation led Usher to the hospital. We have stresses on did, situation, hospital. Like, real clarity around this. He's he's probably the most assertive that I've seen him so far. Yeah. He, he's, um, uh, he leans in. Uh, his gestures get, get bigger. He has these... Plosive sounds. They're big and powerful when he can hit those plosive sounds. He, he probably couldn't be uh, more uh, aggressive, let's say, about his vehemence for this being fact. Uh, and what comes across to me, I'm just really reiterating what you're, what you're saying here, Chase, but he's obsessive about what is just and right and decent. He's not judgmental about the acts, but he does feel that there's an injustice uh, going on there or something insincere happening, that, um, that if, if, a, if a wrong has happened, people should call out the wrong, um, else they're being... Uh, insincere, and and he doesn't like that. Um, so we, so we're what comes across to me is we've got somebody here with a very strong code, a very strong set of values. Whether you value them or I value them doesn't make any difference. He has a set of values. He feels that other people should within that group should be following those same values. And if he if if they don't or they say one thing and they do another, then he doesn't like the hypocrisy and there should be some kind of justice around that. Incredibly strong. Uh, the last thing about this um, from the descriptions that are given, um, if I ever get, guys, a an invitation to uh, Puffy Camp, remind me not to go. Just just remind me, just say, no, 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 don't. don't Mark, you're going to get beaten up in the notes. It's Diddy Camp. It's Diddy Camp. Diddy Camp. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Diddy Camp. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Diddy Camp. Yeah, remind me not to attend. I heard the sleeping bags are best in the world. <laughs> yeah, at that yeah. I don't want to even think about the sleeping bags. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? No? Scott, Scott. what do you got? All right. I'm going to keep it light here. You guys covered almost everything. But these are, and sort of going back to what even Mark, Mark said, these are the largest illustrators we've seen so far. His cadence has slowed down. His diction is the clearest and cleanest it's been. I'm just pretty much matching what you guys said so far. But he's making sure he gets the specifics of this or for this picture that he's creating and, and telling you about. He's making sure he gets that perfect because he wants that to be clean in your head. I think this one's a big deal to him. And he's making sure what he says gets everything across so there's no question about what happened here. And I've got other stuff, but I'm going to leave it because it's, it's reiterating. Yeah, I had 16 uh, hours on this one too, but I saved it because <laughs> just so you guys save could save it for the, for the marathon. I'll have to give that Actually, one to Greg. Do it in early, dude. Gosh. Maybe that'll be something to do sometime. Is we take we we take just one thing, just and wait we a lot as that. long as we possibly. <laughs> <laughs> it's Let's like a, it. the biggest he Philly scratched his nose. Ever. He scratched his nose. <laughs> oh yeah, and then we we'll oh. go back and forth. 
yeah, yeah. discuss it. Let's do like a five second clip and then we'll we'll make an hour long video out of it. I'll talk about like the biochemistry of the right. blood vessels right. and the nose and yeah, yeah. oh we could okay. do it. We could do it. We'll, we'll, we'll get back background in history and where his family came from. Yes. That'll be yeah, yeah. record numbers of unsubscribes. <laughs> we all it can't let's I'd say let's not make it five seconds. Let's go just make it like a blip and go, oh right. yeah. Right. Oh my Ooh. gosh! You know. This is a classic, you see everybody. That? Classic. Yeah. Pause the video. Expressions are screaming at me. <laughs> Go grab it. The drink. next one. Then the next one will make it like four minutes long. Come back in and say, "Wow, I really believe him." Greg, what do you yeah. got? That's pretty good. <laughs> Everybody goes around and does that. Okay, and he also alleges that you know Diddy is the one that told him personally that he slept with Usher and Stevie J. Well, I, I mentioned that earlier that he said uh, about Stevie J. The Usher part. That that's a touchy situation, man. You know what I'm saying? Because I had a certain feeling and I, I felt a certain way when Usher got on Shay Shay, and I don't mean to mention other people platforms, but he got on Shay Shay and he mentioned how great and how good Puff taught him and everything. You know what I'm saying? About the business. Right? I know, and people know, that was around that in that time that Puff and Usher had, did have a situation. And that situation led Usher to the hospital. Now, I let Usher explain that to y'all. I let Usher tell that story. But how dare you say a man that groomed you, you're going to give him a pass. Bro, you know I know. Let me re let, let me reframe you on something. Remember Usher? We was at the Swiss Hotel. Puff was had Kim in the room. Had one of Keith Sweat's baby mothers in the in in the uh the big room outside the master bedroom. He came outside in his robe. He came outside in his robe. She gave him a right there. His back was turned to me. She gave him a You knocked on the door. I came and opened the door for you. Puff went in the room. You came in the room and kissed that girl dead in her mouth. Now I'm telling that because you take enough of somebody that you know and a lot of more people know didn't do you right when you was at Diddy Camp. Y'all put it together. And what you mean by Diddy Camp? Remember? He was on... Um, one of the talk shows, the white guy with the curly hair, what's his name? Um, the white guy with the curly hair. And he said, yo, would you send your son to Diddy Camp? And I just said, no, no. Ask him why he won't send him to Diddy Camp. But yet and still, you praise him. Damn, man, and you said that, I know you can't go into detail, but you said that uh, it was a situation where Diddy sent him to the hospital? Let Usher explain that to you. Let Usher mom explain that to you. And the hospital was in Scarsdale, New York. All right, Chase, what do you got? Scott, what do you got? <laughs> oh, go ahead. What do you go ahead, dude? I'll go last on this one. Okay. What do you think? What do you got? One of the most important things to understand if you're studying behavior profiling is that everybody is screwed up, including you, including us. Everybody's screwed up. The most important thing I could ever tell you when it comes to this is to understand how a person deals with judgment and shame. Just those two things will set you light years ahead of most people. Not just their fear of judgment, but what they judge other people for as well. And this is one of the most revealing things about people. It shows either way 
uh, either what they're trying to conceal about themselves or what they're trying to display a lack of by judging other people, projecting it. And when it comes to shame, we all have some kind of shame. Everybody walks around with some, some have a lot. And when you get to a point where you can observe how someone hides or conceals their shame, that's a big deal. When they conceal it from the public, you know more about them than they probably know about themselves. And the ways that they conceal shame, it's through typically like deflection, uh, projection, aggression, uh, or even overcompensation, maybe, can tell us a lot about their core beliefs and their self-esteem and what they value the most. So if you're ever perplexed or confused about this and you can't figure somebody out, go back to this. Write this one down. What does this person do with judgment and shame? And Usher may have some of this going on. I don't know. And if you're tuned into that world, which I'm not, you can use this to peel back probably way more than other people are going to see. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Well, Scott, what do you got? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we know how he deals with some of that. We're not going to talk about that. He he Cosby. Do you remember in the last video we did, he did some Cosby. So that's a great call out. He goes, no, we're not going to talk about that and move right on. What I like about this one is we see a very different approach to what this guy does. We talk about baselining eye movement all the time. And we say visual eye accessing cues, auditory eye accessing cues. Watch his eyes. And the whole time when he's been bringing up, he talked about a hotel room. His eyes went up above his brow ridge and to his left as he was describing the hotel room. Now he's trying to describe a guy. He doesn't even know what his name is. He just says a curly hair guy, but he's reaching for his name. Watch. He doesn't have it stored. He's looking for it over here in this other database that's open. So he's rifling around in a new place we've not seen him do yet. That's a deviation. And that's a good thing because it means that he probably doesn't know this name, but he knew the other stuff he's been telling us. He moves to a descriptor, curly hair. He further, this just further enforces every time he's gone back and looked to his left that he's telling us what he remembers. You know, facts are sticky things and memory is, as we always say, edited every time he touched it. So it's for sure what he remembers, not necessarily the truth. We can't ever tell that. Um, then he starts to think, really think and struggle with what, God. see him put his hand to his chin and think about the statue, the thinker, and you see that sitting with her hand on the chin and looking down. That's profound enough that it's been in our lexicon for our entire lives to know that people are thinking when they do that. Here's another interesting thing. We always talk about the chin boss being shame, but this is another use of it. There are a couple of other uses. You may do it for acceptance. Yep, yep, yep. But you may also use it when you're uncertain of something and like, well, what the hell? I don't know. And I think that's what we're seeing it used for here. We usually mostly associate with grief and shame, but this is a different use than we see most of the time. I don't think he's in grief or shame here. So don't jump to that because you see the chin boss. Then that last thing I think is a shot across the bow and maybe an invitation. When he does that big volume and leans in and says he went to the hospital and the hospital was in Scarsdale, New York. That's a threat. That's a, Hey, I'm not just telling you, I'm telling you I know where the kid went, and there's probably a record of it. And maybe he may even be shouting to people who are doing investigation where to look. That's powerful. Mark, what yeah. you got? Yeah, interesting. It, it it does get a little more messy here, a little more complicated, uh, I would say. And, and, and here's where I think we see him at his most emotional so far. I think he picks up that drink in order to regulate his – emotions at that point because he's very strong on and still you praise him and still you praise him again i think he's gone back to this theme of hypocrisy um i don't know what it is in in his life and his moral code or his values that means on this on this piece of usher being i guess corrupted in some way and still supporting diddy that that is um uh hypocrisy in my mind he loses somewhat maybe the understanding that usher may well have compromat on him there may well be compromising material that means that usher can only say well he's a great guy because if you go back to uh deals earlier 
uh, not even theory. He says, this is what they do. This is what they do. They get you into a position whereby you're in one sexual act and then you end up in another sexual act and they have the, the evidence of that and they will use that on you. Why is that not a possibility for Usher? And why might you not take that into consideration around this hypocrisy? Well, I would say because the the code of not being uh, uh, hypocritical is too great for Deal. Uh, you know, interesting. Why would that be for him? What's happened in his life that means that hypocrisy is something that can't be overlooked in any way whatsoever? So uh, that's all I got on that one. Scott, what do you got? So, Mark, Greg Davis, the comedian, yeah, French comedian. When he yeah. talks about doing this when he was a kid, is that common in? in oh, oh England? yeah, yeah. So when 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 you were kid, that's what you do to 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 go. Oh, I reckon. Yeah, I reckon that happened. I reckon it's the way you would signal mm. to other people that you think they're telling porky pies, and you go, yeah, I reckon, <laughs> reckon. Okay. Explain porky pies. Oh, pork pies, lies, Cockney rhyming slang comes from, originally from canting. Um, uh, from Italian, cantare, to sing. But the criminals who tended to be in the East, okay, they would have been all over London, but the idea of canting being in the East End was that the criminal fraternities and sororities there would have a secret language. So the the the, the peelers, um, the coppers, the police wouldn't know what they're talking about. And that generated, uh, in the end, into Cockney rhyming slang where you... Um, where in order to protect what you're talking about, you find some words that rhyme with what you're actually saying. So pork pie, lie. Uh, or what you turn it into is is porky. You're doing, somebody's uh, telling porkies, pork pies, lies. Helpful, Scott? Right. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks. And what you mean by Diddy Count? Remember? He was on... Um, one of the talk shows... The white guy with the curly hair, what's his name? Um, the white guy with the curly hair. And he said, yo, would you send your son to Diddy Camp? And I just said, no, no. Ask him why he won't send him to Diddy Camp. But yet and still, you praise him. Damn, man, and you said that, I know you can't go into detail, but you said that uh, it was a situation where Diddy sent him to the hospital? Let Usher explain that to you. Let Usher mama explain that to you. And the hospital was in Scarsdale, New York. Keefe D, what you think about that situation, yo? What's going on with that? Well, uh, I spoke to Keefe D's son, and Keefe D's son said that uh, he was all right, he was fine. He never got beat up in jail. All that it was bullshit. He in jail with family or you know, friends, and he's doing good. They just trying to get this money up so he can come home. I don't think he's going to get the money, bro. Who's going to put the money up for that, yo? I don't know, man. I don't know. Do you still feel the same? You think he's still going to win it? I know he's going to win it. I know he's going to win it. You got to realize he got a trial by judge. The judge has to file... The judge has to... Follow the letter of the law. There's only circumstantial evidence and hearsay on a murder case. Appreciate you. I'll holler at you later. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I like this because he's now has several degrees of separation from the subject here. I spoke to Keefe D's son, and you see him look off to the side in a way that we hadn't seen him look off. He calms down. This, for me, I think he knows is more speculative. It's not first-hand knowledge, and he's not as confident when he doesn't have first-hand knowledge, which, again, takes me back to all of that stuff where he is bold with it, he's plosive with the sounds. I mean, he is... He is happy to really fill the space to the maximum because he was there and he believes this is true. 
it's not that he's he's saying, look, I just don't know if this is true, but on, a, on an unconscious level, he's not as confident with this uh, information. Uh, and we're back with that theme as well to what's just and right in the letter of the law. He has a belief that if it goes to court, the judge will have to follow the letter of the law. Well, yeah, that that is that is a belief, and they will or they they won't, and we'll find out what happens. But certainly, he is he's um, we're back to that that theme of doing what is right and doing what should be done, and not deviating from that. So strong code from him. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so we start off with some auditory eye accessing. Remember I said when he was looking at pictures, his eyes went up really hard to his left, but up above his brow ridge here, it's back to his left, but somewhere between his brow ridge and his cheekbone. I associate that typically on either side with auditory. It's over the temporal lobes in that area. And so we see him accessing what he's done. Look, his cadence and his tone go to one of a recall conversation. Instead of what I've heard, it's what he's telling. It's something that somebody said to him. It's like I called your mother and she said, tell Chase's leaf whistles in the mail. And we go from there and we just run down the list. It's just canting and just saying, boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. And I think it looks really good. And if you don't believe that, when you see a deviation, the only deviation we see in, is in that lilting and that telling and even changing cadence from his normal speak is when he suddenly realizes the guy's probably right and this guy's not getting out of jail. Watch his hat. Boom, boom. That thing we talked about before, that billboard of emotion, he's suddenly like, oh, yeah, I never thought of that. And it drops. He immediately then goes to adapting, rubbing on his thighs, and to emotional eye accessing, which we haven't seen a lot from this guy, meaning looking down into his right. And that kind of thing typically we associate with feeling and with that person. Then that negative illustrator, that right hand, goes out for circumstantial evidence in a murder case. I think it's believable. Again, he's just telling you what he heard. And this makes everything before this even more believable. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, in full agreement here. This uh, is actually the, the only time that we see any doubt, even if it's a little bit. There's a, And this is the only time we see any doubt and self-soothing behavior here when he's speaking specifically about Keefe D., so remember when you're learning to spot behaviors, always start with understanding that people are reasons and not facts. We're a collection of behavioral patterns that got us three things throughout our formative years, friends, safety, and recognition. So if you see an adult, there's an extremely good chance that you're also seeing a continuation of patterns that they unconsciously developed in their formative years that help them win friends stay safe or feel safe and gain some kind of recognition. And it's very possible that P. Diddy, granted, I know nothing uh, about this case so far, has patterns that can be easily spotted. And if you can identify these patterns, you can predict human behavior uh, with some pretty stunning accuracy. So interesting to see here, but keep in mind there's a little conjecture and he's he's not knowing He's not claiming to know 100% fact here either. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. And this one, I think it's a lot of stress we're seeing. And we're seeing stress from an emotional attachment to the person he's talking about. So I think that's why we see that head duck down. And I, I think he's worried about him. He's worried about getting money to get him out. So apparently they're they're fairly tight, which would make sense. Uh, from, from simply by the way he's acting about it. We see him rubbing his legs. You know, he gets that, that the classic hand rub thing going when you see stress. His head's hanging. We get the lowered volume in his voice and, and that this cadence slows down. All those things let us know that there's an emotional situation or attachment to this person. And like Greg was saying, every everything, we're pretty much covering the same stuff from the leaf whistle to the, the hanging head and the, the uh, lowered uh, vocal volume all that stuff keefy d what you think about that situation yo what's going on with that well uh i spoke to keefy d's son and keefy d's son said that uh he was all right he was fine he never got beat up in jail all that it was bullshit he in jail with family or you know, friends and he's doing good they just trying to get this money up so he can come home i don't think he's gonna get the money bro who gonna put the money up for that, yo? I don't know, man. I don't know. Do you still feel the same? You think he's still gonna win it? I know he's gonna win it. I know he's gonna win it. 
you got to realize you got a trial by judge. The judge has to file. The judge has to follow the letter of the law. There's only circumstantial evidence and hearsay on a murder case. Appreciate you. I'll holler at you later. All right, we've watched all these videos. We've broken them down to let you know what we think about those. We've all sort of made up our mind about what's happening. And Mark, why don't you sum your ideas up about this? Yeah, look, we rarely, I think, deal with somebody who's being honest because it's probably less entertaining. <laughs> Who knows? But, you know, more of our videos would be about people who've done something really wrong and they're trying to hide that. This, for me, is one of the best examples we've seen of somebody being absolutely honest. Uh, you know, uh, very credible, uh, not only witness to events, but character witness as well. So... You know, it'd be interesting where we see him show up further uh, in this whole, um, I don't know, extraordinary case that may well uh, erupt further. Uh, but very, very honest behaviours and somebody with a moral code as well, which was interesting for me to, to look at as well. Chase, uh, what do you got there? And a moral code rare for us to see here, mm. <laughs> for sure. I think the video is a powerful reminder uh, that corruption happens when behaviors become normalized, authority and status grow, and when the corruption is unchecked. In situations like this, we see power being weaponized and aimed at people who were either vulnerable or who stood in the way. And what's truly weird is that you don't know whether I'm still referring to the CIA or P. Diddy. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's a difficult one to separate. And I think you started off this entire video with the right the right path. And that was around the organism doing what made the organism successful. To me, what we're seeing here is a guy who has had exposure to someone who is hidden, hidden from public sight, doing a lot of things that are not public knowledge. But he had exposure. The reason we covered only the things he said he had firsthand experience with. And so what we're after is looking for consistency for congruency and message, but also for consistency between different types of stories. And he had consistency throughout these. The only time we saw any real deviation in consistency was when he was talking about some, something someone else had told him. I think that's a beautiful equation and leads us to believe this guy's telling the truth. Scott, what do you got? We always get uh, people in the comments saying, why don't you do somebody who's not telling the truth or who's telling the truth? What does it look like when somebody's being honest? Because we see little portions of people being honest like uh, Mark was saying. So I think this is a great study in someone who, from my opinion, and apparently all of our, our opinions, this person is being honest and they're telling you what, what they think from the heart. This is what it looks like. This is what it sounds like. These are all the cues you're seeing that let you know that, or that would suggest that. In other words, everything is as it should be. So <laughs> just so you know, these guys got after me because I say that a lot. Everything is as it should be. Which is, I thought, made sense because everything is as it should be if nothing's wrong. Am I right? As am I should. right? Who says am I right? Am I right? Am I right? But you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And you did everything on, on very specific words and phrases like yeah. I did just then. It was great. <laughs> Nicely done. Nicely done. <laughs> and don't forget to check out the behavior only on Merritt Street Media. Look behavior. up your local listings. Yeah, Panel. TV that matters. Yeah. <laughs> All right, <laughs> fellas, thanks. This is another good one, and we'll see you next time. So what do you got? <laughs>